I know this room is quite far from where the other sessions are, so thank you for making it all the way over here. Um, I'm sorry I was late. Um, I, obviously, this session was supposed to be yesterday. I had some food poisoning. <laughs> but you made it here, and as did I, so yay. Um, today, we're going to talk about style guide driven development. All hail the robot overlords. Um, I'm realizing, looking at this title, that it was a bit click baity. Um, I don't actually have any pictures of robots in any of my slides, uh, so I apologize for that. Right? I can I can play a name of a giant song called Robot Parade if that'll help, um, but otherwise, yeah. Robots are a, a sort of a metaphor for the automation in front end. So. Um, if you don't know who I am, I'm John Alban Wilkins. I'm a senior front end developer for Previous Next. Um, I am also a serial um, open source developer. Um, I got started with the, the Zen theme. I'm still the maintainer of that. And then I wrote a whole bunch of modules just to support all the things that the theme system couldn't do. Um, blah, blah, blah. You can find all of them listed there under slash u slash John Album. Um, also branched out really to other bits in, on GitHub. Send grids, normalize, SES, uh, KSS node, and chroma. Um, we're going to talk a lot about, well, you're going to see a lot of KSS node uh, today because that's the, uh, the automated style guide bit. Um, so uh, yesterday when I missed the original session, um, I finally managed to drag myself uh, out of the hotel um, and make it to a boff, which was at 2 o'clock. And if you came, I, it was wonderful. It was a just a style guide uh, discussion boff. Um, and it it was really illuminating to me because the thing that everybody wanted to talk about was process. Um, and when you talk about process, it's it's it doesn't really work when you just have somebody up here lecturing you about process because it's really about questions and conversations, right? So I'm going to start that sort of conversation thing here. How many how many people here are comfortable with raising their hand when the presenter asks you a question? Fantastic. Okay. How many people would prefer to just yell something out? <laughs> okay. One. It, Morton will be here soon too. So, he, um, so the, the the question that I want to start the conversation with um, is where are we headed? Okay. Um, Nicholas Gallagher has this great quote. Wow, that's in incredibly small font. Um, so <laughs> He says, uh, are you new to front-end web development? Here's a secret. No one really knows what they're doing either. Um, and if you look at front-end blog posts, um, they're, they're all over the place. There's all these different technologies that are going on. Uh, Vagrant, uh, NPM, SAS, less web components, uh, BHAT, regression testing, CSS frameworks, bootstrap, linting. Um, it's incredibly difficult to figure out what's the thing that I'm supposed to do next, right? Um, and yeah, I feel like there's so many more. Travis, uh, why slow? Page speed. Um, <laughs> and the the essential problem here. Yeah, stop that. <laughs> okay, the essential problem here is is what uh, Frank Chimero, um said last year, which is everybody is describing the one little piece they've created, um, but don't explain or even reference the larger concepts of how all of these elements link together, right? Um, and it's because, you know, we're like, we're at DrupalCon, so of course we're talking about Drupal. So we're talking about the technology. It's really easy to focus in on those little bits while you're at a technology conference and while you're talking about one particular thing on your blog post, right? So technology is sort of like focusing in on the, you know, the brush work of a particular painting, right? It's wonderfully detailed and you can learn a lot by looking at it at this detail. But of course, you have no idea what's going on until you step back and look at the entire picture, right? And process is that, you know, process is all about understanding the bigger picture, right? So when uh, previous DrupalCon people were asked, like, what's going on? I, we don't understand what's going on. And I thought about it, and, and I've been doing this long enough. I've been doing web development since 1994, no, 93, um, that it's a little bit easier for me to figure some of those stuff out or at least realize that I don't have to try to do everything that I see in a blog post this week. I can think about the bigger picture for a little bit and not worry about some of the technologies. So 
Uh, can people in the back hear me? I want to make sure that I'm the right microphone. Okay, good. Um, when I tried to make sense of this, all of these different technologies, I realized that basically there were, there's only really three categories. Um, there's front-end performance, components, and continuous integration. So any of these front-end projects can be described using you know one or more of these three broad categories. And and to, to re-say this without so much jargon um, is basically you're you're making shit faster, you're making shit modular, and you're automating the shit. Right. Those are the three things that you have to, to do. That that's it. That describes any project. Um, and I don't know if you want to play a fun game where like people just yell out projects and then I tell you which three categories it is, but we could. There's a one person who was yelling out. You want to try? Oh well. Anyway, what was that? No JS. So. So definitely, you know, the Node.js packages um, are all about components, right? Because you're you're building a system using all these different Node.js packages, and those those are components, right? Um, suppose I, I don't know Node.js like web server si system. I would think that that's all about front end performance as well, right? So like I said, th they can be combinations of things, but these are the sort of yeah, and, and continuous integration, you know, it's got some of that in there as well because, you, you know, you're building up with a package.json, you're able to build these projects much faster. That's part of the, the automation. Okay. <laughs> so um, to understand, you know, where we're headed, is it's good to take a look at how we're, we've been doing stuff traditionally, uh, and that's always, like, waterfall, right? So we, we plan our projects, um, then we, do, like, design them, uh, then we develop them, and then, then themers get totally shafted by being last in this process um, right before the deadline. Um, and there are a couple of different things here that can go wrong. Um, one is, you know, you, you get to, you know, let's say today's there on this timeline, and you realize that you're not going to be able to finish by the deadline. So what do you do? You, do you go over budget and, like, your company loses money because you went over, you know, you went over the past the deadline and you have a fixed bid? Or... You know, one other way you could do it is just not do half of this the theming bit, right? So you 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 limit the scope to meet the deadline because it's a hard deadline in this case, right? Um, and what happens here? What this means is that essentially, since you're only theming half of the stuff that you developed and designed and planned, you've wasted an insane amount of time. You could have completed this project, you know, months ago in the middle of this thing. You could have completed the entire project that gotten the same result for half the money. This is a horrible way to do projects, right? Um, and software developers have been looking at this problem because it's not just a front-end problem, it is a software development problem. And so they've started to do what's called agile development. Um, how many people here are like totally not familiar with agile development? So you've all heard of it, you know a little bit. We're gonna go through super fast, oops, I want that last slide. So agile development is all about reducing the risk by controlling and minimizing your risk, okay? Um, and, and a typical Agile project looks like this. This is, um, this is, yeah, I think this is the way most Agile projects are. This is how you would do it in Scrum, which is what I'm trained in. Um, you still have the start and end deadline, um, but you break that timeline into a discrete set of sprints. So we have two weeks, and you just find that the end of those two weeks, that's the end of sprint one, and then the next sprint is another two weeks, and you just divide up that time into these equal parts. And you organize your project by creating a backlog of features. And you go through and discuss with the product owner, which is oftentimes just the client, like who's in charge of this, the end result, right? Um, and you prioritize all these features. So you decide which ones are the most important. Those go at the top of your backlog. So for sprint one, you basically just grab the first couple features that are in your backlog and start working on them. And when you finish the sprint, you're supposed to finish those features, right? So then um, the next sprint, you just grab the next couple of you know, features and start doing those and complete them during your next sprint. And for each two-week sprint, you're going through with the client, with the product owner, and you're prioritizing, reprioritizing the goals because... Surprise, sometimes the you know, priorities change in the middle of a project. But 
since we're reprioritizing at each stage of the sprint, there's a minimization of like things that can go wrong, right? So like the priorities completely change. Um, you can react to that much quicker than in a waterfall process. Um, and yeah, each sprint you prioritize project goals, you complete those set of features, and then you create something that's potentially releasable, right? Because you've completed those set of features, so you could have you know some some product. Um, and uh, the question then becomes, you know, what does it mean to do a website using agile development, right? And uh, I got hired by previous Next about a year ago, and and Kip Pepper asked me. She said he asked he uh, he said how do we get designers and front end developers integrated into our agile workflow? Um, because they had they'd trained all their back end developers in, in agile, and they were couldn't figure out how to get front end developers and the designers you know into that process better because they were you know transitioning from this um, the waterfall method. So all the designs done up front, and they're like, wait a second, how do we how do we do agile and, and web development that includes you know design and everything? Um, but by the way, does everybody here know Kim? Kim Pepper, he's a Drupal eight developer. I think I have a picture of him somewhere. Oh, there we go. That's Kim. N not Photoshop in any way, I swear. Um, and uh, I told Kim like, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea how to do all of this stuff. But uh, he, uh, he, and and uh, Owen Lansbury, uh, who are the co-owners of Previous Next, uh, sent me to a training, and I became a certified Scrum Master. And then after that training, it like became really obvious to me exactly how we do it. Um, and the process of, of building website with agile development is style guide driven development. Um, and the, the requirements for this are, are pretty simple. Um, component based design and automated style guides. Right? So uh, the entire rest of this presentation is just going to be talking about those two things and showing you demos of those things. Um, so let's start off by component-based web design. There's been a lot of talk about components recently, um, including several uh, sessions already. I think there was a session right before this that was about um, about components. Um, so uh, when I say components, I'm talking about object and OS, CSS, uh, module and smacks, block and block element modifier. For some reason, we can never decide what to call this thing, even though we all know what it is. Um, it's web component in, in the sort of upcoming HTML spec. Um, but essentially what a design component is, it's um, you're trying to find a, a single chunk of design that, um, that you can reuse, right? So it's applied to a sort of loose, loose collection of HTML elements. It's completely repeatable, even if you never repeat it, right? So like the header of your website is going to be a component, even though you won't have multiple headers on, you know, the page. But it's still discrete, repeatable chunk of CSS, right? Um, and it's specific um, in that the uh, we would replace the CSS specificity, which gets us into so much hot water, um, and replace it with a, a naming convention that's very specific. So you you have a you know a class name that is very specific, but it's very low specificity because it's just a single class name on your rule sets, um, and uh, they're they're self-contained, right? If so, if you apply that class to something, it's n those styles are not going to bleed over into other things. Um, and finally, they're they're nestable, right? So you can have um, a sort of mini component that fits nicely into a larger component. Layout is actually a, just a certain type of component um, where it just moves giant chunks of the page around, um, and then you obviously nest all of your other components inside the layout. Um, let's see here. Let's so here's a website that I did several years ago, um, and if you look at this, this is a good, um, good design system that was made. So it's it was really easy to translate into components um, because you can see here that there's a there's a lot of repeating elements already. And so we have this giant sort of teaser at the top here with name, um, and uh, there's a category next to the date and some teaser text um, in another category at the very top left here. Um, and that's very similar to this other sort of medium-sized teaser, um, which also has this, this share count in red circle there. Um, so bits of this, I think the share count is actually a, a mini component 
right? So it's its its own component. And then the larger teaser is a uh, has a certain styling of it. And because it shares a lot with this, this medium size as well, um, you end up reusing some of those CSS in, inside other components. So I, in true agile fashion, I've done iterations of this presentation multiple times. Um, I'm not sure if I need to go over this at all. Who, who here has not seen this slide before? So yeah, maybe about third, a half of you. I don't know. What do you What do you think? Should we go over this stuff again? Because I've done it at, you know, at it, I did it in Austin. I did it in Amsterdam as well. Um, I'll go over it super brief. That way we get sort of a good balance um, for the people who've never seen it and then those people who have seen it a couple times already. Jeez, get on with it, John. Um, so to me, basically everything is a component, right? So every single piece of design is going to be a component. These base components, those are um, the design that you apply to an HTML element, right? So like block quote is an HTML element. Your selector for that rule set is block quote. Um, and uh, you are applying a sort of default design to that HTML element. Um, this is super useful for like the WYSIWYG area of your Drupal site because a lot of times you don't have as much control over you know, adding the right classes and the right markup in there. So if you style um, you, all of your sort of HTML elements with some default styling, it'll at least uh, look decent then inside the WYSIWYG area. Uh, layout component is another kind of component, um, which like I said before, is just moving large sections of your page around um, and then is a container for all of your other components. And then all the other components, the a component basically has five different parts. Um, the sort of wrapper component itself, like if it's a really simple component, it may just have the one thing, right? So it's it's just a component, it's a single HTML element, it has a single class that you apply to it, you're done. Like that's, it's a really simple component. Um, actually, yeah, I wanna go through. So, yeah, I'll go through this fast. So, uh, if it's a simple component, you just have a single selector, a single class dot flower, and it applies that design, right? Um, and more complicated components will then oftentimes have elements um, where you are having to apply a class name to some of that, you know, HTML that's in this collect loose collection of HTML, right? So these are the petals. So you would like add that class and make a rule set for that just to apply that particular chunk of design. Um, you have flower faces, flower stems, uh, flower leaves. Um, and I want to make sure that you understand that that I really did mean like a loose collection of HTML elements because you know, flower bed, this is obviously a wrapper element around the normal flower, um, but it's it's not it's not nested inside the flower, it's it's outside the flower, right? So just because it's, you know, dot flower underscore underscore bed, that doesn't imply that it is a sub HTML element in the DOM, right? It's not a child element in the DOM. It's these, all of these HTML elements are just sort of like next to each other on the DOM, not necessarily in any particular um, structure. Um, then we go on to uh, modifiers, which is basically a variation of it. So you have a um, flower dash dash tulip, and this applies almost exactly the same design, but slightly tweaked. We'll, we'll get these a lot of times in our designs where, um, you know, the like those teasers, right? So the, the main teaser had, has certain styling in it, and then like you've got a slightly variate, you have a different teaser on a different page, and it's like 90% the same, but slightly different. So you end up reusing all of that same CSS, um, and I usually put it in the exact same file. So like a component and its variation will go in the same file, um, and then you just add a extra rule that applies the tulip variation of the, of the CSS, right? Um, then after modifiers, we've got state, right? So this is the hover state of our flower component, right? Um, and there, there are various kinds of, of, of uh, states. This one is, a, what's it, a pseudo element, pseudo, yeah, pseudo class. And uh, you also have like 
JavaScript applied classes. So um, dot is pollinating. This would be you know some JavaScript event has happened and it's inserted this extra class into the markup, right? Um, and, and then of course uh, media queries are states, right? So this is the this is the depth stop version of the flower component. Um, and, uh, and don't forget that print styles are also, you know, media queries. So this is this is the print version. Um, and then and then lastly, we have um, the skin. This is something that is not used in many places. Um, like university sites like having skins, and like Yahoo back in the day used to have like. You know, the main page was like all yellow because it's Yahoo, and like the finance section then had to be all green because it's money. Um, so, but the, the skin is basically, you know, let me show you skin. So here's the is night, yeah, the flower during nighttime. So this this is a a uh, a variation, a modifier essentially, but that class name is applied at sort of like at the body class, so it affects a whole bunch of components, right? So. Um, it's essentially just a modifier, but where you define how it gets modified is a, a different place in the HTML. So, um, whoops. Here we go. So uh, I actually have an automated style guide of uh, this. So if you go to johnalbin.github.io flower power, you can see an actual like HTML representation of all this stuff. And, and if people don't quite understand you know the idea of behind components. You can go there and and get some examples. Um, now, one thing I would say is that I didn't talk much about the naming convention here. Um, and uh, I've got a slide and a couple slides here that talk about Drupal eight. Um, but I feel that sometimes people overcomplicate stuff. Um, I've seen this on an actual website, um, which I've worked on. Uh, this wasn't me in particular, but it was on a website that it developed. Um, and it's it's trying to describe too much things here. Um, it's it's trying to come up with, it's trying to show you that this is sort of nesting HTML and you just, you don't need to have that kind of um, verbosity in your, your component namings. Um, oh yeah, this actually goes on for a little while. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, but, but you know, I, I don't name the person who actually wrote this, but I, I would like to say that, you know, sucking at something is the first step to becoming sort of good at something, right? So it, it's it's okay to mis mistakes, right? Um, and I think that a lot of times we have a hard time naming things because we see this naming things is hard, right? How many people have heard this this statement before, right? Yeah, almost everybody, right? Um, it's. You know, it, there's, an, there's an old saying, an uh, old joke, uh, there are two th hard things in computer science, uh, naming things, cache invalidations, and off by one errors, right? Uh, and, you know, the setup to the joke is that they're obviously talking about a very serious thing, right? Because they mentioned naming things, and everybody knows that that's really hard, right? Um, and the thing is, is that this statement by itself is wrong. <laughs> Um, because naming things is hard if the names are user facing, right? And it's that if that's really important there, right? It, it's not true unless you have the if. So it's it's if the names are user facing, if if it, whoops, whoops. that's gone too far. Let me go back. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love a good comic sound joke, yeah. <laughs> Um, and the, the idea behind this is, is, is that if you have like these words in your like user interface of Drupal, right, you have to make sure you get that stuff named properly. Like, you know, the, the tweet button, you want to make sure that all those things that people can see are named well and make sense. But we're CSS developers, right? So like the only people who see our names are inspecting the HTML, right? <laughs> um, and as long as you document all of your names, the, the and you know, those, those names are basically just for internal use of your team. So poor naming, giving it a bad name, has a very low cost, right? So if, as long as you document it, there's not, it's not too bad because you have some documentation, the other developers read it, and then they understand what it is, even if it's a really bad name. 
Um, so I wanted to give people some advice about how to name things and not get stressed out about this, um, which is spend 30 seconds trying to come up with a name for your design component, right? Don't worry about it. Develop it, um, and then when you're done sort of developing, like, oh, now it works in IE8, yay! Um, then you can spend five minutes like thinking about it again. Okay, mm -hmm. right, um, and maybe like add a little to-do comment there if you think it should be renamed to something else, um, and then like commit it. Uh, oh, also if you're doing like peer reviews, you can have somebody else spend five minutes thinking about it, right, um, and then commit it, right, um, and after some time you can refactor. I mean, it's okay um, because these are internal names for your team for the people who are developing the website. Um, it's really low cost, so don't stress out. I've seen projects go really off the rails um, trying to come up with these things. Um, and the most important thing is naming conventions. So naming conventions is way more important than the actual names. Right? Um, the Drupal 8 CSS coding standards uh, talk about the naming convention that we're using in Drupal 8, and that is essentially that, that uh, the syntax that I was showing you earlier in that flower example is the same thing. So here, here it is again. Um, you can go to the Drupal 8 website and, and see you know, all of this stuff. But um, essentially, the way that we're going to do it, and we are doing it in Drupal 8, is, is uh, the name of the component, um, if it's a multi-word thing that you can't figure out how to do it in one word, then you put a dash in between the different words. So that's the component. Uh, modifiers are, you know, you, you know when you look at the HTML element or the, the HTML source and you see a dash dash there, that, that means this is a variation of the normal component. Um, and then double underscore means that it's um, a, you know, a piece of the component. Um, sometimes you know, a, a variant of your component will need special styling for a particular element, so that's the way that thing will look. And then you have your different states, is state, hover, I mean, this is basically all the different kinds of variations you should ever see in your, in your CSS. Um, I have a very flat structure of how I keep my components organized um, because it's, it's really easy to find stuff. Um, you inspect that if you're coming onto a project and you don't know what's going on, you inspect the DOM, uh, find the CSS class on the actual HTML element, and then go look for that, you know, a file with that, that component folder. Now, how many people here uh, have difficulty adding classes into the markup? <laughs> right. So the rest of you don't use Drupal? <laughs> um, I'll give you one little sort of Cody tip here, which is the, the fugly selector hack. Um, I used to have a picture of Morton on this slide, but I took it off and trying to be nice to him. Um, the you know, especially with, with uh, links in particular inside Drupal, it's really hard to get down into that A tag and insert the classes you want, right? So this is a very typical one. So um, say this is a, a, a node teaser, right? So then I can get at the node TPL, right? So it's fairly easy for me to add in, you know, this class name that wraps around the H2, right? So feature title there, that I've got that class in, but I can't figure out how to get um, the class that I wish I could use on the H, on the, uh, on the link inside the H2 is, you know, feature underscore underscore title dash link. I can't figure out how to get that into the Drupal markup. So instead I write some SAS, right? And presumably you can do this with less as well. Um, but I write the DOM that I wasn't able to change with Drupal and then extend into the class name that I wish I could have used. So above this, I've got a rule um, that is using, that says feature underscore underscore title link that has all the CSS. And then at the bottom of my files, I've got these like, these ugly sort of fugly selectors that extend then into the beautiful bit. So this is super helpful because I find that if I'm, if I'm looking at a really ugly selector while I'm writing my CSS properties, I forget about how a component's supposed to be structured, right? I accidentally write a rule set that will bleed into something else. If I write it this way with all of my nice rules at the top and then the ugly selectors at the bottom, it allows me to write very concise components that don't bleed into other things. Um, 
that's components. You know, step one of uh, you know doing style guide driven development. We can start at two fifteen. Yeah. Okay. Good. So we're now we're going to talk about style guides. So halfway point. I first started using style guides on in web development in nineteen ninety six. Um, and essentially, it was just a PDF document. But it, you know, it was it was nice. It, your style guide is a is documentation for a design system, right? So you have this document that describes exactly how you should be applying the design to different parts of your website or to you know, your corporate branding, you know, the side of the the truck, whatever. These are what documentation, what style guides are, and you know, they're amazing. They're really really nice. The problem is, is that out of date style guides are completely useless. They suck so hard. <laughs> Um, and the more that I would use style guides in web projects, I would, you know, get designers who would be like, you know, they're frazzled because they have strong deadlines, and they're like, oh, here, here's a style guide. Um, so the changes that I discussed with the client for the last two weeks aren't in here. Um, <laughs> so that this page and that page are out of date, and, and yeah, you'll figure it out, right? And then I'll, I'll forget that later on the project, and I'll implement exactly what the style guide is, and then, like, they'll yell at me for not doing it the way that they said to do it rather than the way was documented to do it. Um, so it stopped using style guides, right? <laughs> I was basically like, okay, you've got enough time to update the Photoshop file. Don't worry about a style guide because it's never right anyway. Um, but when I was looking at all the blog posts of front-end development, like, oh, you know, this is going on, this is going on, I saw one thing that caught my eye was because I'd used style guides before and I knew how much they sucked, automated style guides sounded really interesting to me. Um, and, and this idea is basically that uh, as you write your CSS, the, there's software that, that automatically generates the style guide for you, right? And I was like, okay, that gets around this problem of being out of date. If you're updating your styles um, and like there's a, just a little bit of documentation in there that you also update because it takes like a minute and a half to do, then you can sort of ensure that your style guide is always up to date because you just tweak the CSS file right there and boom. So one of the ones that I like, and there are a whole bunch of different style guide systems, but one of the ones that I really like for simplicity is KSS, uh, which stands for Nile Style Sheets or something like that. I can't remember what it is. Um, but it is a spec for how you write uh, CSS comments so that you know KSS parsers can go in and grab it and generate style guides for you. Um, and uh, the the spec comes with a Ruby implementation, which if you want to use, you have to build a Ruby app in order to use. So I didn't really like that one, but I found a, a Node.js variant of it um, that actually worked when I tried it, which was amazing. Um, and that's github.com slash KSS node. Um, in fact, I like this so much, I'm, I'm now one of the maintainers for the project. Um, so this is an example of a uh, KSS comment. Um, it's, it's just so easy to write. So uh, this is using CSS syntax, but of course you can also use slash slash space, like you know, C SAS comments, that works as well. Um, the first line is basically the title of the component that you're writing. In this case, we're writing a button. And then you can have zero or more paragraphs that talk about it. So like, this is a standard but button suitable for clicking, you know, and then I'll have a list of like all of my variations of it. So like there's a shiny button that you shouldn't press because it's a big shiny red button. Um, and then, then there's a hover state, right? So you can have your variations and your hover sort of listed here underneath. And then the very last thing here is basically it is a style guide and it is components.button. So what that last line says is um, you're building an automated style guide. So you need some sort of navigation to get to all the places. So we're going to let you create your own hierarchy of how you navigate through your style guide. Right? So in this case, we've decided that we're going to, one of the sections of the style guide is going to be called components. And then we're defining that this is the, you know, the button thing that goes under components. And you can have as many levels of the style guide that you want. So you could, um, if you wanted to have like components.forms.button, you can do that. It's up to you for defining the hierarchy. And the software will just parse through that and find all of your components and then create them you know, in the hierarchy and build the style guide using the hierarchy that you've designed. Right? Um, 
and th that's it. Like that's all you have to do as far as writing KSS. Um, super simple, and then you just have the parser go and do it. So essentially, this is this is what we have. You since you've built all of your designs using group components, you can think of all of those things as like a component library. Um, so you have your CSS source, and sometimes you can have you know, um, different. Uh, what's the what's the JavaScript preprocessor? Um, Sorry, what was that? Oh, no, no, less. Yeah, that's another SAS preprocessor. We're talking about the uh, JavaScript preprocessor. CoffeeScript, yeah, there we go. Yeah, so CoffeeScript, and they can all be generated, and, and you end up with this individual source here. And then over in the corner there is Drupal, and it's sucking in, of course, all the raw source that, that the web is expecting, which is CSS and HTML and JavaScript. And your style guide is reading through all of your CSS source files, whatever language you happen to be using, um, and then gener generating a stack of you know HTML files, static HTML files that describe all of those components, um, and then it's sort of hot linking in um, the same HTML and the same CSS that are going into your application. So then, really nice thing is that then when you look at your style guide, it is showing you an exact representation of that component. It's not a picture of that component, it is the real component living in the style guide the way it will live in your application as well. Um, that's that's super, super useful. I'm gonna show you a demo now. Um, but the first thing you're gonna see in the demo um, is that I'm using a task runner, right? Um, and uh, a, a task runner is, it's basically, well, these are all the different things you can do with a task runner. Um, it's a way to automate a whole bunch of different steps. If you're only doing one of these things, then you don't need a task runner, right? If you're only just building SAS or building CSS from SAS, then you don't need a task runner, but, right? So that's what I was doing. I never used you know, Grunt or anything like that because we're just making SAS or just making CSS. And then as soon as I started using style guides in my system, I needed a way to build the style guide. So then I'm doing two things and then I had to pick a task runner because then it allowed me instead of having to type two commands like do the SAS, oh now do the style guide, it was really repetitive. Now I just have a single command which is like gulp watch and it watches all my SAS files and goes oh let's generate some CSS, oh you change the SAS file, I'll gener regenerate the style guide. Right? So that's what a task runner is for. And um, w right now by default in, in, in our project, the previous next, we're doing those first three things here. Um, we're building CSS, we're linting all of our CSS um, and all of our JavaScript, um, and then we're building the style guide. Um, we have plans to also add visual regression testing to that, which was an excellent session on that earlier in the week. Um, and then of course you can do live reloading, which we're just, we're having some issues trying to get it to work. <laughs> if you know how to get that integrated with Gulp, by the way, come and see me afterwards. <laughs> um, so all of these things you can do with a single command, right? So you run, run the command, it generates a SAS, can reload your browser after it loads all that stuff up. Um, let's do a live demo. Um, so, um, watching software get installed on you know, Wi Fi is really fun. Uh, <laughs> so, I, I've done it ahead of time. <laughs> um, and then you can, I'll, I'll just go over the commands that I did. So I, I get cloned um, the Zen theme um, and then switched over to the 7.x, 6.x branch. Um, I've got, I'm about 85% of the way done with having, you know, a fully described style guide inside uh, this version of Zen. Uh, so I've switched to that branch. Um, it's sort of in the alpha level stage. Um, everything works, um, but it, some things might change before the actual 6.0 version comes out. Um, and the first thing that I'm gonna do is, uh, right now I have uh, some Ruby requirements, so um, I have to run bundle install, um, which will read from a gem file. Let's see here. So um, it just reads, like I'm using breakpoint uh, in SAS to control media queries and stuff like that. So it just reads through this real fast when I type bundle install and installs the minimum requirements for this project. And you see here it's fetching all that stuff. It's installing SAS, uh, installing Compass. Um, and 
and then at the end there, it's actually going to create a, it automatically creates a gem file.lock file, which says these are the exact versions of the software that I happen to just download, and you may want to share that with other people on your team because otherwise it's going to suck for you, right? So I always add that to, to Git and make sure it's in the project so that everybody is on the same page as far as versions go. Um, and then, you know, KSS Node is a Node.js uh, application, so I have to run npm install, which does the same thing. It will look in the npm install, will look in the package.js, oops, package.json file. Um, and then grab all of these node things, including uh, KSS, and we'll install it here. And you can see it's going through. This took so long during the keynote. <laughs> um, scrolling is much better. And finishes. Um, and then the last thing is that, it, um, like the gem file.lock file had the exact versions, um, Node has the same thing, but you have to write an extra s step. So npm shrink wrap dash dash dev will create this file which says these are the exact versions of this software that I use so that everybody on your team is using the same thing. So that uh, only the first person who does npm install has to do this step because once your project has an npm shrink wrap file in it or, or a gem file.lock file in there, when you type bundle install and when you type npm install, it actually ignores the original gem file. It ignores the original package.json and just looks at the shrink wrap, just looks at the lock file and builds from that file. Okay. And of course, yeah, got to add it to, to Git. Um, and yeah, so that's it as far as like requirements of getting everything installed. Um, and I, like I said, I'm using gulp. Um, which was also installed when I ran npm install. So I'm going to type gulp, and it's going to clean out any old CSS here. Um, it started generating some style guide stuff. So here it's sort of listing all of the different files that it's parsing, grabbing some HTML. Um, this is that's, like I said, it's alpha software, so I'm getting a warning here, but that's just because I haven't updated the, the layouts yet. Um, and then pff, it's finished, right? Um, and then it's doing some linting at the end, and boom. Um, it created this dog I just now. Um, if I go and uh, this is sort of just sort of prove to you that that folder used to be empty until five seconds ago. Um, and if I hit reload now, There we go. So it just, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'll be here all, all day. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is a style guide, and this is the hierarchy that I you know, specified inside my KSS comments here. So I've decided that the first section of it is gonna be color sass, and then like my base HTML elements, my layouts, and then my components. Um, I, I have a feeling that I'm gonna be playing around with how I organize my components in my style guide because um, well, here's here's a, a project that it, that I'm actually developing right now with Previous Next, um, with with a great team. Um, but if if I pop into the components, there's like 43 different things here, and it gets a little bit long, so I need to play around with reorganizing it. Um, but uh, if we look at this, you're going to see um, all of the sort of boilerplate components that Zen includes. Um, and to make this easier, because obviously you can't see this, it's on my local system, um, I have actually taken the, uh, the Zen style guide and then posted it to GitHub, um, which is where, no, this one. No, it's not. Oh, I know where it is. Uh oh, I didn't load this ahead of time. GitHub.com slash John Alpin Zen style guide. And then click on this link. There we go. Okay. Yay, Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, so uh, this is the you know publicly accessible version of of what you get out of the box. Um, it has a boilerplate list of a bunch of different components that you probably will use, and then anything that you don't use, you can literally just like delete an entire folder. Like I don't need that component, and then you just run gulp again, and pff, your style guide is now up to date again. Um, so this shows all the like colors that are in Drupal um, by default. Um, I'm kind of feeling like there's a little bit too many colors here. I'm going to want to simplify this a little bit before I do a, 
you know, a, a 6.0 release. Um, but you can see here that it's, it's documented all these different colors, um, which is really nice. Um, and then I actually have um, a way to describe the color is using functional names rather than just color names. Instead of, you know, let's make this border red, let's make this thing the border color, right? So um, if we go up here, one of these gray ones is going to be, yeah. So, whoops. This gray medium light color, which is actually, you know, pound CCC, is uh, inherited by the border color. So anytime that I use border as the name of my color, it's going to inherit it from here. Um, and there's actually a way um, with this system, which is called Chroma, um, to have different color schemes. So if you are Yahoo or you know a university and you need like the exact same designs but different colors on different sites, um, you can create a new uh, color scheme where essentially you would just have like somewhere in here you would need to s specify like a primary or secondary color, some like the big colors, right? Um, and then you could create a new scheme and you just define the new primary and secondary colors and everything gets inherited properly uh, so that if you're down at the level of, oh, I've got my autocomplete select background is inheriting from the primary color, I don't need to redefine this color in the new scheme. I'm just redefining the primary color and it all inherits nicely. Um, we needed this for a project recently. So that's, in a nutshell, that's what Chroma does and it's included with, with Zen. Um, but this style guide then, yeah, so we look at our base, and this is a listing of all the HTML elements and their stylings, headings. Um, it, it's it's really nice to just be able to see how all of these different bits of here um, will actually look on your site. And you can see this, you know, the generic link styling, right? Obviously, you want to go in and, and add your actual link styling and then run Gulp again and look at an up-to-date version. Um, let's do that now, actually. Let's go into components, and let's tweak this this box component. Um, so I'm going to open up. I've got a box.scss file. Uh, here I'm using here I'm using the uh, SAS syntax for the comments. Um, super simple box styling for LA. Um, I'm pointing at where I'm keeping my markup. Right now, um, my markup is being kept inside uh, a handlebars file, which is .hbs, but you can also just use vanilla HTML. Um, there is a feature that's getting in, that is almost ready to go in KSS node, which allows you to use Twig uh, for your styles, uh, for your HTML elements. Um, that's gonna be really nice. The nice thing about handlebars right now is that it's, it's really close to the Twig syntax. It's gonna be in Drupal 8. Um, so, and we're going to go back now. Let me see. There. So that's pointing at where your your markup is. You know how are you applying these styles to it? Um, and let's change it so that um, we're going to use. I can find also something ridiculous like ten pixels and more padding, right? So I'll just, uh, actually wait, before I hit save, I should really run Gulp Watch. Um, when I first go run Gulp Watch, it's gonna assume that you've made some changes before you started it, so it's gonna re regenerate everything real fast. Um, and, doo -doo -doo. yeah, it's done. So if I go here, and because I haven't hit save yet, so if I reload, it should still look the same. Yeah, so it looks the same. And now I gotta go back into my editor, hit save, and then I have to real quick go back to my command line. Come on. Was it fast enough? Or did I not hit save? Wrong thing. This might be the live demo error. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for debugging my problem. <laughs> um, do, 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 so. I'm just going to close that tab so I don't do that again. <laughs> um, go back to components. Yeah, box styling for LA. Like it, it regenerated it already. Now it's 10 pixels and super fat padding. So it, if you are, you know, 
editing the CSS and you just don't go up here and also edit the comments, I mean, you're just being dumb because this is incredibly simple. Um, and you end up with a, a style guide that is always up to date. Um, Life to know you're right. So let's go back to the last couple slides here before I take questions um, because I haven't really talked about um, the process, right? So we've started doing this as a previous next and yeah. it's been a huge win, um, really big win for for the designers, for the back end developers, and for the front end developers. Um, one of the things that it does um, is uh, it does it allows us to do decoupled development because you know if you remember way at the beginning I had that uh, waterfall diagram where like the back end developers have to finish making the HTML before I can style it so the front end developers have to go second right but because we're designing inside the style guide we can literally as soon as the designs have you worked with a designer and you've finished the design you can start making your components in the style guide while the back end developer is writing all the custom php for that 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 goes into that component right and i i this this is an actual quote from a back end developer i love the style guide stuff it means i can make things pretty right because I no longer have to, as a front end developer, I no longer have to touch Drupal really. Like the back end developer can just look at the style guide and go, oh, I need that class and that class, and that's, this is the rough HTML. I'll just use that inside this TPL file. Right? So the responsibility of who makes the you know, theme level change um, is, is decoupled. It, it can be the front end developer, or it could be the back end developer. Right? So um, that, that's a huge win. Um, and and don't underestimate the, you know, this, I'm you know I can make things pretty aspect of it because that's it's really nice for a backend developer that they can make things look really good. I mean that this is essentially why Bootstrap has become so popular. It's not from front end developers. It's from back end developers or people who don't know front end that are able to make things look pretty with Bootstrap because they can just sort of copy and paste. And you can do that with your own custom designs right, by creating a component library and by automatically generating your style guide. Right. Um, one of the nice things of, of uh, having food poisoning yesterday um, <laughs> uh, was that I, I got to this, I got to go to the, the first thing that I got to go to was as a boff. I managed to drag myself out of bed um, about style guide generation. Um, and I thought it was going to be more technical, the, the things that we would talk about, but everybody wanted to talk about process, about how this affects the way people actually work. Um, and this the style guides become basically the key feature you know, of, your, of your process that allows your designers, your front end developers, and your back end developers all to work together. Um, and, and you end up with a, a, a whole bunch of wins. So like the clients can see work progressing faster because they don't necessarily have to have all of the PHP bits done before they start to see some of the designs. Because that was one of the things that traditionally like my project manager would freak out because of like, oh, I'm doing some theming and like everything looks really bad until like the last week when all of a sudden everything shoop, magically sort of comes together and looks like a real design. Right? having the style guide show the little chunks of design, everybody gets a much better sense of like, okay, we're actually making good progress on this. We're you know, not sweating quite so much as we go through the process. Um, lawyers are happy. Um, <laughs> this is something that I learned yesterday was is that, you know, they were like, you know, as a university, you know, IT person, how do I convince all these other colleges that they have to follow a style guide? They just wanna do whatever the hell designs that they wanna do. And somebody, somebody else came in and was saying, well, you know, talk about you know, accessibility and how people that aren't following accessibility standards are getting sued for millions of dollars now, right? They're starting to really go after people who don't follow the accessibility laws of 508 you know, compliance, right? Um, so having a style guide that meets those accessibility requirements means that you know, the lawyers are happy. They're like, look, we've built this thing that will m ensure that there's accessibility in your site. So therefore, you know, you over there in the arts, you know, history, you have to follow the style guide, <laughs> right? Um, it's, 
it's really, really interesting. And I keep learning more about about winds of how you include uh, style guides at, um, and how it's affecting people's processes. And um, I, I would just love to like have a learn more about how how style guides are affecting different people. And I hope I've been able to convince you um, what a game changer this has been for 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 myself and for other people who have started using this in their process. So. Uh, thank you, and, and, and let's start having some questions here. Put the mic here. Hello. Hello. Is it on? Hello? Yeah, okay. All right. Um, so, so we use a, we sort of, I guess we have almost the a backwards approach. Like we use a style guide, but we actually use the style guide module inside of Drupal. And then so we have like the des designs made, and then you know, our team is just going and basically do the style guide page while we're working on, you know, all the other stuff and that way the team sort of moves as we're working. So just curious, you know, if you see like the two could be sort of complementary to one another or is one better than the other or did you try doing it this way and I'm going down way the wrong path or just <laughs> um so th I haven't I I've I haven't looked at the style guide module in a long time. Somebody asked this exact same question at Amsterdam and I just haven't had time to look at it again. Way back when it was first written, like I was sitting next to Ken Rickard when he wrote it. So like I know the capabilities just happened. It was nice for, for the time. Um, and I don't know about his new capabilities. So I would love it if somebody would give me a demo of the style guide module. Um, the reason why we picked KSS node um, was uh, uh, two reasons basically, is that it gave us the ability to have a standard tool that we could use on any kind of projects, whether it was a Drupal project or like you know app development or something else, it's it's independent of of Drupal. Therefore, we're we're not rel you know dependent on you know a Drupal eight version of the style guide module being written before we do our first Drupal eight site. Right. Um, that's why we we picked KSS Node, um, and we were also trying to get out of the sandbox a little bit. You know, like by using a tool that's available to anybody who does web development. We're hoping to leverage uh, more contributors and, and getting a better better sense of what's out there. So, Like I said, if somebody's used a style guide module, come show me a demo, please. Um, so my question uh, is, um, you know, Drupal outputs a lot of crazy things like views and exposed filters and there's really? a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> there's, sorry. There's, there's a lot of markup uh, and stuff to that and I was wondering how you would want to handle things like that within the, the style guide uh, mod model that you sort of have here. Right. So um, when we when we do it in the style guide, um, the, the markup that we write, of course, is right now it's, it's in a handlebars file. Um, and uh, we try to do like an idealized markup. Um, so like if we could get Drupal to do it, we wish it looked like this, right? Um, now I know that sometimes when we go to the actual implementation in Drupal, we can't quite get it the exact same way. But if, if we've written the CSS itself, you know, good enough, a lot of times we can just sort of ignore, you know, six or seven layers of divs there and just <laughs> apply like the, the class name on like the outermost div and then like on a couple of the inner divs, right? And you still get the same design even though um, oftentimes what will happen is there'll be some random middle div there that's getting CSS from the date module and then we have to like override it. But uh, <laughs> it, that's, you know, if you have a really good backend developer, they can change the markup to do whatever the heck they want, right? <laughs> um, but sometimes we'll, we'll know ahead of time that the markup that Drupal's gonna give you, like for the menus, it's gotta be a nested list of unordered lists, right? So we know ahead of time that it's gonna be that. So um, when I was creating the boilerplate HTML for Zen, uh, sometimes I would go in and, and do an HTML spec on a particular piece of Drupal code and then copy and paste that chunk of HTML into my into my file and my style guide um, and then start like cutting stuff out but still having the sort of skeleton of what's needed, That w the skeleton of what Drupal is actually gonna give you. You mentioned the previous session, um, which was about uh, Pattern Lab. And my question is to understand how you see the process of how potentially what you're describing and what Pattern Lab does, at least to my understanding, how those things work together. 
it seems to me from a first glance of seeing these things that Pattern Lab generates a style guide that we then use to define our theme. And this appears to be defining the theme that generates the style guide. So if my understanding is incorrect, I'd like to be challenged, definitely. And But my, my question is, how, how does the process work for those style guides? Right. So um, if, and maybe I can go back to that one slide. We had a very similar question in Amsterdam. Um, so this one. Right. And the places where I've drawn these boxes, like this is the component library, and this is the style guide over here, and this is the application, those are kind of arbitrary. Um, the thing that I wanted to say was that these resources are being shared among all these different parts. And whether you think of the component library as being inside the theme and therefore part of Drupal, part of the app, and the style guide is separate, or like, for example, this style guide was then, and of course, is inside the theme too. So maybe it's part of the theme and it's part of the component library. Those are kind of arbitrary definitions of where the things are. Um, really quick, Pattern Lab, for those of you who don't know it, is, is essentially it's an alternate uh, style guide generation tool that's, you know, it's PHP based um, and it does a very similar thing to KSS Node. Um, and I didn't get far enough, we, it was one of the, it was like KSS Node and Pattern Lab were the two things that we were evaluating, or they were the last two things we were evaluating, like it's gonna be one of these two, and we ended up with KSS Node. Um, so I didn't get into the details of like how you specify a component in Pattern Lab, but w the, r the only reason why we didn't choose Pattern Lab um, was because it, out of the box, it's very tied to um, the elements, atoms, um, organisms way of describing web systems that Brad Frost came up with um, and we weren't using that approach so it was the, the nice thing I mean like you could you could still create a hierarchy um, that was like that in KSS node but it, it does not care about what your hierarchy is like you define it so it's, it's super flexible so we could ad still adopt like Brad Frost all that stuff and put it into KSS node that'd be easy um, understanding that you picked one that helps me a lot thank you yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just kind of curious how this ties into client deliverables. Like, are you delivering the style guides, or you know, are you delivering some, you know, homepage PSD, program page PSD, and then building the components out from there? Um, so the I'm going to answer the PSD question part of it first. Um, I've worked with two different kinds of designers at Previous Next. Um, one of whom is not that uh, is still developing their CSS skills, right? So they're more comfortable doing the designs initially in Photoshop, right? Which is totally fine. So like you just you just make sure that they are understanding that they need to think of this component methodology so that they're building discrete design chunks inside their Photoshop file, right? Um, and then you can have a conversation with them about, okay, how do I extract those out into design, you know, and how do these different components work together, right? Um, and uh, the, the other kind of designer that I've worked with is like, they also know CSS. So uh, they, um, it's whatever process is, is more comfortable f for the designer, right? Um, and you just as a front developer, you have to work with them so that um, th th this other designer, he did, he actually ended up learning how to like write KSS comments because it's actually really easy. So then like he makes some of the, of the components himself, right? Um, and then like I'll do a peer review just to make sure that he's got all like the front end, performance bits, you know, all the dots uh, above the eyes and cross T's and this sort of stuff. So the the approach that you work with the designer depends on the designer and just have a conversation. That's the most important bit. There was a second part of that question though and I forget what it was. Uh, how does it tie into client deliverables? Right, client deliverables. So um, to, I would say that yes, it's a deliverable, right? Um, and the reason for this is because the the website that they get is it's a living entity, right? And you may not be the next developer that modifies this website, right? So if you've got a style guide in place, you're, you're lowering the cost of further development for the client. So making sure that they understand that there's a style guide here um, that you know future developers can come in and learn how to apply the same designs to new features later 
that's a huge win for them. So absolutely, it's part of the deliverables. Um, sometimes they'll have internal developers that they you know have on staff, and we'll do the initial design or the initial implementation, and then hand it off, and they get this great style guide. And as long as they keep it up to date, which is fairly easy to do. Um, then they can continue on their way and adding new features to the site with their internal devs. Um, kind of building off of that. Uh, basically, have you been found that having this helps reduce the number of deliverables? Like currently, you know, we'll do five or six page designs and, you know, our designers sometimes have problems actually figuring out the components they can reuse. I'm trying to kind of help figure out a way to reduce the number of designs so we don't have these mm -hmm. slight variations and mm -hmm. issues like that. Yeah, well, um, yeah, oh, yeah. one of the things that, one of the other sort of process wins is with the designers, if you've got a designer who's who's not on the project full time, like they've just done some designs and then they've finished up what they think is all of the design and they go off and they're doing some other project and then they come back like three weeks later because there's one thing that you forgot to design. They come back like, sometimes they can be so frazzled that they forgot what they've designed before and like, oh, I've got a new feature. I have it after half an hour to do it before I have to go on this other project. And then they're just like, they'll just whip up a new design. It looks completely different <laughs> from what's on the other site. So having a style guide, like showing them what's already been built, like they can go and look through their designs on this style guide. And they're like, oh, well, it just needs that. And then it becomes a five minute task for them instead of a half an hour task. Like, there's a huge win for, for that. The style guide becomes a great place for everybody to know what's going on and familiarize yourself with. Uh, uh, with the project. Uh, the very first time I used KSS Node uh, was actually on a project that um, I was brought in late in the project just to help with the development in front of it. was a big, like, four or five different front-end developers working on this project. Huge code base, and they were like, ah, you, you know, just jump into tickets and you'll familiarize, familiarize yourself with the code base as you go. Three months later, I still had no idea where anything was because it was just huge and confusing to me. And so I started implementing a style guide for that site as a defense mechanism so that I could figure out what was going on. Right. Thank you. So. We'll, do, we'll do these these last two people in the line here because it's, it's, it's over here as far as uh, time-wise goes. There's nobody else coming in here, but we'll, we'll finish up these questions. Feel free to leave if you need to go to another session. Otherwise, is there any more sessions? The plenary is last. Okay. So the... KSS node is good for like visualizing classes. Um, is there anything, like does it handle like visualizing mixins? Is there anything automated for? Right, so um, if you look at this, the syntax here, it's, there's nothing really that's tying this comment to the dot button class, except that it happens to be in the same file. Like KSS node, like you could write a completely different CSS selector and you have no idea, right? <laughs> the, the way that this gets matched up in the style guide is that y you've written this CSS selector and then presumably in, whoops, oh, well, I don't have a markup in there. In the, uh, if I had pointed at an HTML file in, in this comment, it would be, the HTML file is the one that has the class in it. That's so they just get matched up in the normal way HTML and CSS get matched up. Matched up. That means that you can actually describe anything you want with the KSS comment. Really, it doesn't have to be about CSS. So, um, if you uh, actually if you write a comment like this without a link to s some separate markup, it's going to assume that it's a SAS preprocessor. Um, and if I go over to the demo. Where's my key? Oh, there it is. I guess what I'm wondering is, let's say you have a mix-in that's like, I don't know, called big ass text or something like that. Like how, is there a way to visualize without that being applied to a class specifically S in the code base? Um, I, know, I know what you're saying. Um, I haven't got that far in, in my exploration with, with style guides, but essentially I've got a, a section here that talks about mixins. So I've got like, I've documented my clear fix mixin, which is just like inside my SAS folder here, um, so that I know, oh, I can use this clear, this clear fix mixin 
and I've got an RTL mixin that will apply right to left styles if I need it. Um, so uh, visually hidden mixin. Um, so you can describe all your your mixins just using KSS comments and just putting it inside the hierarchy however you okay. want. That's as far as I've gotten. I, it's actually a really good idea. Um, I, I do have an actual component though that is dot visually hidden, so that one gets described in the in the the uh, style guide. If you click in down into components, then you would see probably how it gets applied. But it's it's a little bit separate. One. Maybe I could add a link that says if you want to know what this mixin looks like, go look at this other mixin or this other okay. component. Maybe. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Last question. Um, so you, you talk about you have a. Um, a bullet there for layouts uh, as a component as well. I, I think this is broken right now. Did I'm in like this is the last. Anyway, go ahead. Okay, so I, I'm just wondering if you could talk about like the intention, of how that would uh, look within the, the the frame of the, the, the KSS. That is an excellent question because you're like, well, wait a second, it's a media query. So um, so if I would jump over to the ACC one, I, uh, the way that the style guide looks is. You can change it the way you want it to. This is the default way that the style guide looks. Um, the the markup in the style guide is written in such a way that the styles that apply, to, you know, like this gray sidebar, are completely separate and won't bleed across into your own custom components. They all all those like all the classes are like KSS dot whatever or KSS dash whatever. So they're not going to go into your components. Um, but you're right. Like this this is a layout here um, and the breakpoints are all wrong because the layout normally is going to be full width of the um, of this window and instead it's just this little section of the style guide. Um, that's one of the open issues in in this and is that I want to figure out how to get it so that the media query applies properly to to that thing. It's not going to be too hard it's just like I haven't got to it. I've been too many other features implementing it so um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, I was I was del yeah, I was delegating it to another one of my friends and he said